Hi everybody, and welcome to my video about the Nikon N6006 in some markets outside, actually I think all the markets outside the US. This was called the F610. So this first video is going to be a general overview of the camera's features, the interface, and the second video is going to do more in-depth things like go over how to actually manipulate the menus to achieve uh, photographic results mount and unmount lenses, load film, unload film, batteries, all of that stuff. This video is just going to look at the buttons and the what they are and talk a little bit about what they are as well and give you some general biographical information about this camera so that as you learn to use it you have a better understanding of what you're working with. So first off, this is an interchangeable lens SLR and what that means is that multiple lenses can be put on the camera they can be taken on and off within the same roll of film and the light that comes through the lens goes into this uh, box here the mirror box and from the mirror box bounces up through the pentaprism up here on top and out through the viewfinder eyepiece on the back so what you see when you look through the back of the camera here is exactly what the lens is seeing and uh, pretty darn close to what the film is going to see in terms of the frame. The meter has three metering modes and there's spot, center weighted, and matrix. We'll talk a little bit more about these in the second video but I'm going to give you a quick overview right now and what that means is let's just say for the sake of argument that what you're seeing on screen right now represents what you're, you would see through this camera in matrix metering, we'll start big and we'll go to small. In matrix metering, the camera would take everything in the image here and combine it to give you a meter reading. The way that the meter works is it assumes that everything is a flat gray scale. So it takes the bright area over here and the dark area over here and averages them all together with everything else that's around it to figure out what is gray. The um, center weighted metering, what that does is take an area about the center, about the same size as this lens mount right here, and about the same orientation, and it says that this represents 60% of the meter information. Everything else outside of that circle represents 40%. So if you have a bright or a dim subject in the middle, it gives a little bit more weight to your metering than the rest of the oppositely lit scene and that's really useful for a lot of shooting for a lot of general purpose shooting especially if you're center framing your subjects um, the last mode is spot mode and what that means is you have a little tiny area right here in the center and that's a hundred percent of the meter data so right now this mirror let's pretend this mirror is pretty close to center so let's assume that the meter would take hundred percent of the meter data from of the, I'm sorry, the meter would take 100% of light, the light data from this mirror. That's fairly close to 18% to a flat gray. 18% is the term for a flat gray. And uh, it's a little bit darker than that. But at any rate, so, it would, so in this case, the meter would be pretty close to spot on. But if you had a very dark subject and a very, in, the, in the center and a light background around it, then the light background would be super blown out. If you had a dark subject with a medium sh shade background, then this background would be super blown out. And if you had a light subject with a medium background, then the background would be super dark because what is happening is it's taking just that little meter data and assuming that regardless of whether it's light, black, or in between, that it's even. It's an even middle tone gray. The camera has shutter speeds that range from bulb, which is bulb meaning as long as you hold down the shutter button, the, the mirror will be open and the shutter will be open, to, and then from 30 seconds up to 1 2,000th of a second. That's a huge, huge range, especially for this level of camera. It allows you a lot of creative capabilities. You can stop motion, really, really fast motion with that 2,000th of a second shutter speed, or you can capture very slow moving objects like clouds and star trails and things like that with the 30 second shutter speed or with bulb for that matter. When you look through the viewfinder on the back, 
the viewfinder has a 0.75x magnification and what that means is that you have 100% of the image coming in through your lens and then it bounces around the pit prism a bunch of times and then it comes out and it's magnified at three quarters of the size coming in through the lens through the viewfinder. The viewfinder frame coverage is 92%. So again, if we assume that what you're seeing in this video right now represents exactly what you're seeing through the viewfinder here, that means that 4% of the uh, uh, in each direction beyond what you can see will be included on the film. And that's pretty useful because it allows you to crop a little bit and still have the image that you saw. Uh, and it's also better to not see quite as much as to see too much because if you see too much then you're going to consistently cut off people's heads, which I can do pretty competently even if I can't see the entire frame. Anyway, uh, so this comes with a standard Nikon autofocus focusing screen and in the second video we're going to take a look through the viewfinder on this camera and you can see what that focusing screen looks like and we'll talk a little bit about what it, that focusing screen tells you and how it gives you metering information and things like that. And lastly, this has a, an onboard flash that is synced to 1 1 25th of a second. And also, as an added, added bonus, this is pretty nice, the onboard flash is uh, through the lens phase detection metered. So the meter that tells you what shutter speed and aperture to use for your images also connects to the flash, so the flash can be made brighter or dimmer depending on what the meter says at the moment the photo is taken to make sure that your images don't appear to be washed out or too dark even when you're using the flash. So that's pretty neat. This camera model was designed for the mid-range consumer. So this isn't a this wasn't intended specifically to be an entry-level camera for somebody who had never used an SLR before. And it also isn't capable enough to be a professional grade camera. So it's kind of in the middle. Someone who's comfortable using an SLR knows the basics of the systems, but doesn't need or uh, will be confused by some of the advanced level things like interchangeable prisms, replacement film backs, and things like that. For most people, that's just not a need. Uh, very few people actually need those capabilities. So for the average user, this is an incredibly capable and good camera. It was produced by Nikon from 1990 to 1994, yay 90s, uh, in Japan. This was a direct descendant of, it was preceded by, the Nikon N2020, which was the American name, or outside of the US, the F501. At the same time that this camera was produced, it was had overlapping production with the N4004, also known as the F401, and the N8008, or the F801. I believe it was also concurrent with the F4, or is that? Yeah, I think that's right. And some other higher-end cameras, the 4004 and 8008 were the ones on either side of this. There were actually a, many more Nikons being made at the same time as this. This was followed directly by the Nikon N70. That was a direct successor to this. Uh, outside of the US, the N70 is called the F70. And in general, with the F digits for Nikon, uh, three, like this one has, the 610, represents a certain range. And two digits represents a higher camera, and one digit represents the professional grade cameras. I don't know why they give the US cameras a different nomenclature, but they do. So anyway, so the next thing we're gonna do is if you have your camera instruction manual, go ahead and grab it. We're gonna go through the top of the camera, then the front, then the back, then the bottom, and then the inside. And we're gonna take a look at all of the different features and interfaces and talk about what they are and how to use them. On the top of the camera, the first thing you'll notice is that on each side we have camera strap lugs. This is where you'll attach your camera strap. Wrist strap, neck strap, shoulder strap, whichever you prefer. Uh, I am a neck and shoulder strap guy. 
and um, that over here we have the mode control buttons and those are these buttons these six buttons on this side and they control the exposure mode which is mode the uh, automatic and this is also the automatic fill flash button I believe I think I put these in this order the ISO and DX control, so this allows you to change your IX and switch into and out of DX or manual ISO setting. Your drive mode and autofocus lock button. Your bracketing button right here, exposure bracketing button. Your meter type button up here on the top. And your self timer button down here on the bottom right for those. Here's the pop-up flash, which you raise by simultaneously pushing both buttons on the sides of the camera prism. We've got a flash hot shoe right here, and so you can put a, mount a flash in here, or you can mount a flash controller and carry a flash off to the side in your hand if you want to. Those are both pretty viable options. Actually, it's always better to carry a flash off camera if you can. The um, LCD uh, panel is right here, this little square LCD panel. Back in the day, that was an awesome and huge LCD panel. The shift button is this button up here that looks like a stop button. Even back when this was made, that was a stop button. That's been the stop button symbol from, since the 70s or before, so I'm not sure why they gave it a stop symbol. At any rate, that's the shift button. The exposure compensation button is this one right here. The on off switch is this long one right here next to the right below the shutter release. Uh, it gives you a hint as to what it does by having a white line that points to either off or on, which I only mention because I, I, I've used hundreds of cameras and I didn't pop out at me at first. What, how to turn it on at any rate um, then we have the command dial and this allows you to control different functions on the LCD screen and the shutter release button right up here and in the second video what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to use all of the buttons on the left side over here what they do and explain the different features and then we're going to take a look at the functions on the LCD panel and talk about how to use the command dial to scroll through the menus it's complex, I won't lie to you. It's a tough, tough set of dials, but once you pick it up, it's gonna make a lot of sense because even though there's a lot to it, it's, it's not illogical. This is the camera's front. And so the first thing that you're gonna notice over here is a big old grip. And this is for when you hold the camera. You can hold it just like that. It's, it's really for, for, especially for a camera of this vintage, it's a pretty ergonomical design. And um, I'm, I'm not a huge fan, I won't lie, of 90s cameras. Uh, I think that was kind of a weak point in camera history. And I think a lot of the designs were subpar in a lot of ways. And a lot of that has to do with the grips and the way that the grip feels in your hand. This is one of the few 90s cameras that I've held that I can say, I don't hate the way it feels. I just, I just don't, it's a personal choice. Some people love 90s cameras. Uh, I am, I am not one of them. At any rate, so then we've also got here, we've got the lens mount. This little hole down here contains a screw drive, which you can get to pop up by switching it off of the M. And that is your autofocus control. The autofocus motor is in the camera, which is pretty great. A lot of modern cameras, Nikons and Canons, not Pentax, because Pentax is awesome, but a lot of the modern Nikons and Canons do not have autofocus motors built into the bodies. Some of the higher end ones do, but the ones that most people are buying won't. And so this was a mid-range camera that can control autofocus lenses without an autofocus motor built into the lens, which allowed it to control less expensive autofocus lenses, which is pretty nice because you can still get decent optics at a less expensive price. And that's something a lot of manufacturers have shied away from for reasons that my jaded anti-corporate mind would equate to greed. But I don't have any actual evidence for that, just throwing that out there. 
The next thing we have is the uh, up here we have electrical contacts and that's how the camera communicates with there you go there you can see them that's how the camera communicates with the lens over here is the meter coupling pin this is inside the lens mount this controls the lens's aperture now if you look in your lens you might be able to see what looks like an iris made of a lot of overlapping little um, leaves plastic plastic or metal leaves this pin allows those causes those to be shut down to whatever the required aperture is just a microsecond before the shutter opens so that you get proper exposure here we have the meter interface pin this is this thing that slides around the top here and what that does is connect to some Nikon lenses and it allows the camera to know where the aperture is set at when you physically control the aperture. For lenses where you can control the aperture in the camera, that is possible with this, and um, so that meter also allows the camera to know when that lens is, part, is set correctly, or with a, the meter connection pin. But by and large, it's used for telling the camera what aperture the lens is set at when you're using a, a um, manually controlled aperture ring. Here we have the lens release button. So you can see when I push this button, there's a little shadow next to my index finger there on the ring. That's a pin that recedes into the camera body when you push it. When, it's, when you mount the lens, this locks into the lens. So in order to take the lens off, you have to push this down and then you can release the lens. Here is the um, here are the controls for manual focus. You can see that the screwdriver is, is pulled back into the camera and you'll be able to manually focus your lens. Here we have autofocus mode S, which is single shot. So you have to press the shutter button, it'll autofocus and then you take your shot. And CF, which is continuous focus, meaning that as long as you have to press the shutter button, it will continue to focus on whatever is in the scene, whether it's something moving or something in the center that you've set your autofocus to, to, to track. And that's really useful for things like sports photography, where you have a cyclist coming at you really fast or a tennis player jumping around the court, something like that. It allows you to get good in-focus shots of action. This camera is so dusty, uh, so dusty. This is the back of the camera. So what we're looking at here on the back side-ish area over here on the side, if you push up, that's how you open up. If you push, how do you put, oh, if you push down, oops, I've been doing too many Canon videos lately. If you push down, that opens up the film back. And the film back or the film door is this hinged part right here. It has this little grip on it and the film type identification window, which is the, the next part of this. When you put a roll of film in, you can see the ISO and number of exposures through that window so you can remember what type of film you're using. I've often, often in my life forgotten that type of film and gone out and shot an entire roll of photos I thought were going to be great black and white photos on slide film. And there's nothing more boring than black and white texture photos on slide film. It's very boring and expensive. I hate doing that. At any rate, then here we have the auto exposure lock button, which allows you to switch between auto exposure locking and unlocking. On the camera's bottom, the next thing we have are the battery door, which you open by just pulling that switch in some direction. There we go. That's how you get into the battery chamber. We have the film uh, rewind release button and the film rewind release lock. So you've got to use these in conjunction to, re to allow your film to rewind. Slide this and then push this and we'll, get, we'll see that in the second video. Here we have the tripod bushing. And that's the back of the bottom of the camera. There's not a whole lot going on on the bottom. It's a mid-market camera so that it doesn't have the ability to hook up to any fancy things that go on the bottom. Well, I guess most of the fancy things that would go on the bottom were actually kind of built into this camera. So, but at any rate, that's the bottom. Not a whole lot going on. Inside the camera is a different story. There's quite a lot to see in here. Over here on the left, this is the film cassette uh, placement area. Film cassette area. 
And what you do is you insert the film here when you're loading the film. You can see there are some gold contacts here. Those read the DX code on the side of the film, those little silver boxes. And that tells the camera what type of film you're putting in. Here we have a film guide. This helps keep the film properly aligned as it's going through the camera. Then these dots on the bottom and these solid lines are the film guide rails. Oops. These dotted lines here on the top and bottom and the solid lines are the film guide rails. The dotted lines help keep the film in place so it doesn't wiggle up and down. And then the solid lines help keep it in conjunction with the film pressure plate on the back of the camera help keep the film flat on plane so that the light hitting it is properly focused. Here we've got the shutter inside of it. It's a vertical travel shutter. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the second video, but let's pretend that this is the shutter. What that means is when you take a picture, it does that. So the shutter moves up and then another one moves in from the bottom. And when it advances, the film, the one that was moved up from the bottom comes down and then the one that was above also comes down, keeping light from coming back into the camera when it's not supposed to. Here is the film tension sprocket and this keeps the film from spooling backwards into the, into the cassette. It prevents double exposures and helps keep proper tension on the film so that it stays flat. We have a series of guides and rollers here which help guide the film into the take up spool right there. We have a little red indicator that gives you an indication of how far you're supposed to pull the film when you load it. And we'll see that again in the second video as well. On this side of the camera in the side, we have some, a film guide roller. This helps keep the, guide, the film moving into the, into the take up area properly. Some more guides and rollers that do the same thing and also help keep it flat. The film pressure plate, which in conjunction with the film rails helps keep it flat. Here we have a cassette spring on this side that helps keep the cassette in place where it's supposed to be, again, to help keep the film flat. And then some foam that prevents light that comes in through this window from fogging your film. And that's the camera inside. Some notes on this camera. It is fully electrical and it will not function without a battery. Also, it's not weather sealed, so don't get it wet. It is compatible with Nikon AIS lenses and AI, um, AI lenses like the Series E lenses only. It is not compatible with the NAI lenses. We saw the shutter in the back when we opened up the camera. Don't touch the shutter. That's a good way to brick a camera. You can either get oil from your fingers on it and that can cause the shutter to jam or worst case scenario is you put your finger in the shutter and it jams around your finger bending the leaves and then you have completely ruined a camera. The next thing to know is not to touch the mirror that's inside the camera body. The oils from your fingers, again, can desilver the mirror and they'll make it harder to focus. They'll make it maybe possibly impossible to focus and they'll also reduce the amount of light coming through the prism, which makes the viewfinder dimmer, which makes it harder to focus. Also, don't leave your camera and lenses in your car because you can get heat damage, uh, which will ruin the camera. And what happens is if the camera gets too hot from, say, being left inside of a car, then lubricating oils and things like that in the camera and lens will get thinner, and then they'll get into places where they're not supposed to be, either the circuitry or the shutter or just other mechanical components. And then when they solidify again, when they get back to normal temperature or, or get gummier or harder, well, those components aren't going to work properly. They can also risk shorting out the board if they get to the wrong place. So store, leaving your camera inside your car is a bad idea and can ruin it. Also, don't store your camera inside of a plastic bag or box because you'll get fungus. If moisture gets in there, and it, it will, it always does, uh, it makes it very easy to fu for fungus to grow. It'll grow and etch the glass or it'll get into parts of the camera it shouldn't and ruin the camera. Also, like I said, this camera is not weather sealed. Don't let it get wet. That will short out the electronic components and ruin it. And just remember that your camera is a precision tool and should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you do that, it will last for a long time. Electro electronic cameras like this won't last quite as long as older mechanical cameras, evidenced by this one, which has a non-functioning flash. The capacitor exploded on the flash, which made a very interesting smell.
but these can still last a very long time. They're well-made cameras. And so as long as you take care of it, it will take care of you. So in the second video, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in depth and how to use a lot of the functions. So click on over to that video. There's a link for it in the description. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the section below. I'm pretty good about responding fairly quickly. If you, uh, this video was helpful, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know I'm on the right track and that lets me know I'm producing content, which is useful to you guys. And if you have any suggestions for videos, please let me know if I have the knowledge and equipment to do it. I'm more than happy to film videos you guys request. In fact, a number of my videos on my channel have come from requests from you guys. One last thing. Thank you guys for watching. Wow, there's a lot of humans in here. You, put the camera on.